420, which is a Wireshark project where you get to practice analyzing network traffic. And um, part, the first 25 points, you know, the required part, the rest is extra credit. And this extra credit part, you might not want to bother if you're not taking 123 because it gets pretty densely into stuff. But anyway, so you run Wireshark. Wireshark is, it runs on every platform. It's on this machine. You don't need a virtual machine or anything. You can if you like, of course, but you can just run it on whatever uh, machine you normally use. It's perfect. It's safe product. It be, let me be careful about that. It is not malware, and you don't normally put malware in Wireshark. The only thing about it is if you run a live capture of live network traffic from your machine, then it presents some risk because the uh, way Wireshark works is you can capture network traffic and it will analyze it with thousands of protocol analysis engines that are contributed by a community of people. And some of those are not secure. So uh, that's why it's recommended not to use Wireshark as a way to collect live traffic very much, but instead to use it to analyze captured traffic in the past, which is what we're going to do here. But that's the only security risk of putting Wireshark on a machine is if you were to leave it running like day and night to like monitor traffic two problems would happen. The first thing is it would be insecure, and the second thing is it'll just fill up the RAM and crash after a while. It's not the right tool for that. The right tool for that is TCP dump, a command line tool that will just monitor traffic and store it in files and such. Anyway, so let's get this file, FTP login. I'll put this in, say, downloads. So, uh, all right. I don't see where my downloads went, but I'll uh, find them. Right, here's my downloads. All right, so I found my downloads folder. I don't know why the browser doesn't present it in a friendly way, but eh, everybody always makes things difficult. All right, so here's the um, Wireshark file, and that's pretty hard to read, and I don't think there's a way for me to make it bigger. Uh, let me just spend a minute and see if there's a way to make it bigger. Um, I kind of doubt it. Font and colors, ooh. Ooh, main window font. Uh, well, I click it and no other choices appear. Um, double click, right click. Hmm. Well, what's the point of telling me that when I can't change it? Is another window popping up somewhere? No? Hmm. Arrows don't do anything well. Uh, all right. Um, and now I can't even get out of this? That means it's probably popped up a window somewhere. I can't see. Oh, here it is. Ah, I found the window. It did pop up a window. I couldn't see. Good. So let's make it um, Lucida Bold 14. Let's see what that does. Well, a little bit better. Let me do a little more of that. Um, preferences. Font. Click this. Okay. Let's make it 18. And then, good, good. Much better. All right. So, um, so what you see here is a SYN being sent to a server, then a SYN ACK coming down, notice the port number, local port 50,690, went up to 443, then a SYN ACK comes down, then an ACK goes up. This is a TCP handshake to connect my high-numbered local port with 443 on a server to make an HTTPS connection, and so on. Now, you can read the packets one by one this way to see what's happening, and that's very tedious because there's always a lot of background traffic that doesn't matter on your network. So let me go to my instructions here. And so... Um, I'm just going to move this to another screen so I can refer to it while I demonstrate things. All right, so this is the packet summary pane, which is where you start, where it gives you an info column is the logical place to start, where you get a quick summary of what every packet is. You also have a time, a packet number, source destination, TCP protocol, and the length of the packet, which are useful but not as useful as the info column over here. Now, in this pane, you have layer-by-layer -layer analysis. This is packet details. So you can see the physical frame, which is the container. Then you can see the layer 2, Ethernet, layer 3 with IP, and layer 4 with TCP. And down here you'll find all the source port and destination port and all the other parameters of the TCP packet. So then down here you've got raw hexadecimal view of the bits going on the wire, which you almost never use. You have to be pretty drastically in trouble by the time you have to dig down here. Typically, you can find what you want here or here. All right, so... We're going to find an FTP password. You can filter for things here. You just type FTP. Notice how it's red. Then it turns green. When you get a filter right, it's green. When it's good, when it's a good syntax. Press enter. 
And is this the, yeah, there's, there's a builder here. I thought there was a builder somewhere. This will help you set things up. Here's how you specify an IP address or an Ethernet address or something. Uh, that might just be history, but I think it's not. Anyway, so there's FTP. So now I'm seeing file transfer protocol, and you can see right here, you can see it's, you can actually just read everything right here. So here's this guy trying to log in. Please log in, user John, password flapper, log in successful. So you got the whole story right there. You don't need to dig through any of this. That's the bribe. FTP is considered highly unsafe. It just sends your name and password in plain text. So anybody that can capture the packets can just totally see your password. Here's another successful pass. All right, so um, that's a start. All right, another one is HTTP. There's a separate file to download for that one. Let me get it. All right, and here it is, HTTP. All right, and this filtering for FTP, so I don't see anything because there's no FTP in here, so I have to clear the filter. Okay, now I see junk in the background like network time protocol and ARP. As usual, a bunch of extra packets I don't care about. But what we care, we want to look here at here is HTTP, which is old unencrypted web traffic. And here is some kind of login going on, getting a login form, um, sending post data up. Unlike FTP, you don't just see the username and password right up here in the info column, but you can pretty much guess it's going to be in there. And um, probably the simplest way to do it is to follow a TCP stream. So here's a get to do a login of some kind. You can right click and follow TCP stream. This is a good way to see what happened, where you'll see um, all the high-level data without any addresses or anything. So here's the request that was sent. Here's the reply that came. So here's somebody loading a login form with a get request and getting a 200 OK. And then something about the favorite icon. So this is not the login process. This is just loading the login form. So I might just try the next stream. But if I do, it might be something that's not HTTP. So in this case, It'd be better to go back to here and return on the HTTP filter again. And uh, that was the first stream. And one way to tell um, one stream from another is to kind of look at the time. Here's something that happened at 9 seconds. Then here's something that happened at 21 seconds and something that happened at 27 seconds. So logically, if this is loading the login form, then one of these later ones is probably where they logged in. So if I follow this stream... Here I have a post, and here I am sending a username and a password up to it. So this is posting to a login form. Here's data. And then down here, I can probably, I could in principle tell if they got in or not, but maybe not because the problem is when they did it, they had an accept encoding gzip up here, which is the default your browser has. And therefore, it sent compressed data back. And I can't read it here. So I don't know whether the reply says welcome or the reply says password rejected. Not from here, but at least I did see what password was sent up. And if I want to see what's there, I can see it by using this detail pane. See, they will actually, even though it came in a zipped form, um, this is the post sending it up. There's an ACK. This is the reply coming back. And see, it, even though the data was um, scrambled, this encrypted data, uh, compressed data, I think, yep, Wireshark will decompress it for me here. So you entered Isaac and Flapper, login denied. So it's kind of nice that way. It won't do it in the stream view, but it will do it in this view. This is fairly common. You often have to go to the different views of Wireshark to find the goodies. What kind of compression did you use? Uh, GZIP. And you specified in the request. If you look at the post um, and look, if you follow the stream again, you can see it there. You tell it what you're allowed, what you will accept. But the default for most browsers is this one you see here, except um, gzip or deflate. So very standard zip routine. So you could also take this data and run it through zip routine, use Python or something. That would be another way to do it. Good. All right, and so here um, we've done the request and reply. So there's a couple of uh, flags to find here. We find this guy's password. And then there's basic authentication, which I ought to show you. Um, basic authentication is a real old technique, but it's still used on the web. Uh, that's another thing to download, and I use it on my pages and places. Basic authentication was a real old-fashioned system. And, um, for example, if you go here, let me just bring this up in Opera. If you go to uh, my website and you try to view the 123 CTF, 
it pops up this box. This is basic authentication. Where it, and what's going on here is, when you try to access something protected by basic authentication, you send a get to the server to load it. And the server replies 401 unauthorized. You are, did not provide authentication. And then your browser knows to pop up a box like this and get a name and password from you and add it to the next request. And the next request will go with an authentication line derived from this, and then the server might let you in if the authentication is correct. That's how basic authentication works. This is not something designed by the web designer. This is your browser asking for the password for the next try. So a basic authentication request will have two guesses. First, you try to load it, and it rejects you. Then you collect the name and password. Then you load it again, and you have a chance of getting in. So that's what this traffic is, is basic authentication traffic, um, basic login one. All right, and so again, I clear the filter, uh, which I can do with the X. Well, I said the X, there we go, okay. And see, I got a bunch of junk I don't care about here. So once again, I use HTTP, and here we are. So here it is, this is what happens. It tried to get the secret file, and it got an unauthorized response. Then it tried again, then it got okay. So what happened in between, the, the browser collected the username and password here and included it in the response. So if you look at this one, this get, um, if you follow this stream for the first one, here it is getting it, and there it is getting an unauthorized reply. So this is just a thing saying the server could not verify you were authorized, forget it, you sent the wrong credentials or something. This is the way you initiate a login for basic authentication, which might seem kind of foolish, but you do initiate it by doing something that's going to fail. And then, when I've run HTTP again, so that's the first one. And like I say, the time is a good way to check it. So here I am at four seconds, and then it collected the name and password, and it was 14 seconds when it apparently had it. So 14 seconds, if I follow this one. Now, it sent an authorization. This is what it looks like. This is basic authentication. It doesn't send your name and password in a readable form. It sends this blob of Base64 encoded stuff. But that is not secure. That is not encryption. It is just encoding. And it can be reversed by any Base64 online tool. And Wireshark will also reverse it, but not in this pane. It will reverse it in the details pane. So it did send basic authentication in this stream. And if you go down here for the get, which the second get, um, they get in this stream, then you'll find it down here, authorization basic, and you can expand it, and then you'll see the username and password. Because all it does is take your username, add a colon, add the password, and then base64 it. So it's a very weak form of security, and that's why people don't like it anymore. Although, if you send it over HTTPS, then it's fine. That adds another layer of encryption on top of it that's strong. But this by itself is pathetic and not very secure. And I think I'm not going to work through the last bit because, like I say, I don't, for people in just the forensics class, I don't much recommend going beyond this point. But you can if you like. There's an APT capture, which I got from Red Team CTF. And um, it, here, a hacker got into a system. They downloaded some tools. They generated a key. They started an encryption session. And you can answer a whole lot of questions figuring it out. But it's kind of tricky to figure out. All right, and how does a TCP stream differ from an HTML stream, um, it's HT there is no HTML stream, but there's HTTP. Um, I think it's always a TCP stream in Wireshark, because HTTP is TCP. So if I go back and clear this filter, and I go to, like if I go here and right click on this ARP and follow, I can't follow a stream because ARP does not have a stream. ARP is a single packet protocol. It sends one packet and you get a reply. Um, you can follow HTTP stream. That's interesting. Normally, I've only followed TCP streams here. But um, you're right. I do see an HTTP stream. Well, well, that's interesting. Let's try and see. I've never done it. I wonder what the difference would be. Seems like it would just be the same. Let's see. If I follow HTTP stream, seems to be just the same. <laughs> So I'm not sure. It's a very good question. As far as I can tell, they're the same. Now, in HTTP2, there might be a difference. I've been uh, just doing a couple of the, the, uh, the, the Web Security Academy web HTTP2 challenges, and HTTP2 is kind of mind-goggling. So, um, and I see it does have a follow HTTP2 stream. HTTP2 streams can be really big, like megabytes. And they're in binary format, 
and it's kind of screwy. So there might be something exciting. And that's quick is like another uh, modern protocol related to HTTP2 that uh, Google came up with to move data more quickly. So um, I guess these must uh, follow it at a higher level, but it's a good question. And I don't know the difference. Anyway, that's all I wanted to show you about that one. Let me stop this video.